All right, we've got 52 folks on, so we'll get ourselves rolling right now. Uh, good morning, my name is John Decker. I'm the Director of Community Services at Alta California Regional Center. We are recording this uh, copy with Community Services, and uh, it's available to review these recordings on our website. If you go to alterregional.org, you can find the link for the coffee to Community Services, uh, and there's YouTube links on there. I am going to say good morning to, let's see, we've got, I see Nicole on here. I see a bunch of uh, regional center staff. I got Zach on here, my assistant, our associate client services director. We've got Tracy Brown here. And we've got community services manager, Olivia Persida, and we've got Gino Nessie, and we've got specialized services and supports manager, Jordan Eller. And we've got Heidi Dilly, Grass Valley office, one of our managers, and Hewitt, our emergency response coordinator, and Cindy Lay, our HCBS specialist. We've got Marty here from our community services department, and Shirley, and Dee Dee, and Heather. Wow, we've got a, a full crowd of folks here. And last but not least, our director of client services, Michelle Johnson, as well, is with us. So we've got uh, about 60 folks on so far this uh, morning, and we're going to get rolling into our agenda. Uh, thank you for rejoining us for this meeting. Uh, it's been, as I mentioned, it's been what, three weeks or so since we last got together, and uh, it was tough. I will tell you, there's so much that occurred over this three weeks. It was a little tough not having this group of folks to kind of talk it out with a little bit, to talk a little bit about what's going on and also how it's impacting you as service providers. So we are going to be discussing some of those things that occurred during that time period and also kind of some upcoming stuff. So um, we're going to be discussing the booster mandate that came out on uh, December 23rd, or excuse me, I would say December 22nd. And uh, we're going to be discussing um, our COVID cases, what's going on at our regional center for our population. We're going to discuss a little bit about uh, testing. Um, about uh, the ability to get tests, how to get tests, et cetera. And I would uh, welcome Dana as well, one of our client services managers who is very faithfully attending these meetings on Friday always. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, the Sacramento County public health order that went out as well a couple of days ago that many of you I'm sure are familiar with. A uh, little discussion about in person services in person meetings with service coordinators, et cetera, just a little kind of a reminder of where we're at. And we'll discuss PPE a little bit and then some of our activities related to our community placement plan um, and community resource development plan submissions to the Department of Developmental Services. So, uh, 1st and foremost, I will, um, as I typically do. I will share my screen so that folks can see where I am pulling my information from. And so you can see here there is a, a, a DDS's website that is up. And if you go to the main page at DDS, is everyone seeing DDS's website there? Yep. Okay, very good. And um, when you go to DDS's website, if you click over to what's new and look at the highlights, you can see information about the booster shot mandate. Certainly heard a lot of over the over the holidays, uh, certainly heard a lot of feedback from service providers um, related to the very short time frame that was put in place for the booster mandate um, for there to be an in essence an immediate expectation that uh, significant amounts of additional testing would need to go on for employees and um, we would share that the regional center is in that exact same boat as well, but we want to make sure that you as service providers are aware where to get this information. We did have some service providers, um, you know, granted, we send this out to everyone that is signed up um, via our MailChimp server at, uh, on our website. But even with the vaccine mandate um, that occurred previously, we still had providers like on the last day of the mandate that we're, you know, kind of wondering what was going on. So we really want folks to be able to navigate to this DDS website and see these important uh, updates that are provided by the Department of Developmental Services. So again, you can find a lot of this stuff on DDS's website and right here there is the booster shot mandate and other information here. One of the things that's helpful in this 
and this is contained in other uh, documents related to the public health order, is timeframes, letting you know, you know, for your staff when um, your staff are need to get going to get boosted or not. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quickly and just talk about this kind of in general. So um, as we did previously, when we talked about the original vaccine mandate that came out, um, it's really important for you as soon as possible as service providers to have discussions with your employees and be able to take a look at how your employees vaccination status aligns with the necessity to have the booster. Um, right now, if you have not figured it out for your staff, I would encourage you to do it as soon as possible and begin outreach to your staff so that they are aware that um, the booster is going to be required. And um, my hope is uh, that you guys by this point have got good enough connections where you can let your staff know where they might go to go get that booster shot as well. Um, I will share for our regional center. We sent out the notice today, I believe, uh, to our staff for folks that are required to uh, get that booster. And we talked a little bit about some upcoming booster shot clinics that we are going to be hosting at the regional center as well. So I just I can't say this enough because it was certainly very frustrating for us as we got towards the end of the vaccine mandate to have discussions with providers that had not, in essence, had the discussions or done the math to figure out their staff and their ability to be able to provide, um, you know, full supports to clients um, because they're, you know, either vaccinated or, or unvaccinated. So, um, again, I just want to encourage each of you to take that time and um, as service providers, you know, look at your staff and look at who needs boosters and, uh, you know, making sure that there is a a route to be able to go and get those. The other side of it then is that, you know, there's, you know, we've got masking that's obviously going to be required for probably more individuals as well. And so we recognize that that is a, a drain on things like PPE and being able to burn through things like uh, masks. So what I am interested in is hearing from you all as service providers, because we haven't really had an opportunity to give you guys a forum to discuss how this current new mandate may be impacting your businesses. And so I really like, especially when we have a group as large as we have today with 68 people that are on, that um, maybe some of you would be willing to share how you are approaching this with your businesses and um, maybe provide some uh, assistance for others that are kind of in a similar boat. So is there any service provider that would be willing to share kind of how they are looking at um, the impact of this at their own companies? Hi, this is Andrea from Alliance. Hey, Andrea. Good morning. Um, I'll say that the booster in the short period of time of testing everyone was sort of an issue. So, um, but we had some experience with accommodations and things, so we're having everyone start testing next week if you haven't had a booster or if you're not getting one by next week. We had also coordinated with the county to become a testing site um, for our employees, <clears throat> which we haven't actually rolled out. So next week will be a trial tester for those folks who weren't able to get into testing. Um, I will say that how OSHA uh, potential ETS that's coming out will affect our part participant employees that I'm more concerned about, but that's not the conversation at the moment because I don't know how to quite do that. So I will stop talking. I wonder if, well, thank you for that. And as you were talking about that, obviously you probably had a number of other people saying, oh, you can become a testing site, what? So um, I wonder if we, you know, we have a week now between uh, when we have our provider advisory committee meeting. And I wonder if we could just remind ourselves that we might want to call on you um, and maybe figure out how an alliance is going through that process so that we can share it more widely with other service providers that might be interested in doing that. Um, and so with that, Andrea, do you mind dropping just your email into the um, chat box in case we do have any other providers that um, are interested in kind of going that route? and. I'm going to check my chat box real quick and then I will see if um, 
I will see if we can uh, get another person to share. Right now, the lack of available COVID testing is a big problem. What happens if staff can't get tested in a timely manner? I think that is what one of the largest concerns is that we're running into right now. We had one of our providers yesterday mention that they were looking at uh, moving from uh, in-person services to remote services, um, largely because of the concern related to not having testing opportunities for their staff. Um, so other companies, other, other uh, responses that you guys have tried to do um, uh, to this new mandate. Do we have any concerns about our ability for our companies to be able to fully comply with the mandate? Hi, John. This is uh, Stephanie Simon. Hey, Stephanie. Morning. Hi. Um, so what I did understanding um, or trying to be sensitive to everyone's concern, I'm holding one on one meetings to address individual concerns and challenges. Right now, I only anticipate maybe one, but it could have an impact, um, but I'm not sure, but I'm really right now just, I should know more probably by Monday, um, but one-on-one -on -one to just try and address their concerns, you know, and to make sure they feel respected and valued because it's just tough. It's just a tough time, so. Thank you very much. I, you know, that the ability to have that personalized response you know, to your employees based on what their concerns are and being able to speak to those concerns. You know, I think that certainly can go absolutely a, a long way. Um, other companies, other ways that you guys have looked at trying to address this with your own staff so far and may, or maybe what you're planning on doing in the next you know, few weeks. Hey, John Garrett. Hey, Garrett. Um, Good morning. Mind if I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. And, and real quickly, let's make sure. Um, so, uh, Stephanie's transportation services, uh, in alliance from Andrea Kroom is they have ILS SLS services and Garrett, if you could just uh, make sure that folks know what type of the services you guys offer as well. Yeah, we have uh, supported living. So we're doing services in people's homes. We have about 35 clients. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of layers to this. Uh, first of all, you have to figure out who's eligible, who's not. Um, so 1 of the concerns and difficulties there is. That there's some uh, administrative overhead, both in time and cost, because um, with the previous mandate, it was everybody by a certain date, and with this one, it's you have to figure out who is vaccinated, who's not, um, and then everybody it becomes eligible for their booster on a different date. Um, so even though you have a whole bunch of people who may need to get boosted at some point, you need to be having these conversations at at, at different times. So we had to figure out. Okay, who has to be tested uh, starting that first week? And then who do we need to be in touch with um, at what point after uh, um, uh, February 1st? So that was sort of the first concern set and thing we had to figure out. Uh, and then it's the, the ongoing cost and uh, availability of testing, which everybody's talking about. I know that um, sort of the hot item that Andrea talked about was becoming a testing site. Um, and that helps solve certain problems like availability of testing because that's being provided to you uh, and you don't pay for the actual test itself, but you have to allocate your staff for training. Um, you have to sign certain waivers and then uh, as an employer, you're also on the hook for staff time. One of the other things that we looked at um, you know, and aside from that, yeah, of course, you can contract with uh, whatever companies um, to get your, your staff tested, uh, or you can say, hey, you're on your own to go do this thing, but, um, you know, consult with, uh, with your lawyers on whether or not you need to pay for your staff's time and, um, and mileage. Uh, the, the other option that we looked into is an option with uh, EMED. Um, are you familiar with them? I'm not. Can you share a little bit about them? Yeah, so EMED, um, they are a company that developed a, a software and um, a partnership with uh, with um, doing the test with Binex now. So they uh, they proctor the 
COVID-19 antigen tests for travel. So when you go and pick those up in the store so that you can take a flight to wherever, that's usually proctored through EMED. Um, so you can do business contracts with them. They'll ship out your tests and then that has some advantages um, because if uh, somebody's not suspected with um, with symptoms um, and they're just doing routine tests, they can do those tests while they're on the clock. So that avoids having to pay the um, the time, the travel, the all that stuff. Um, the downside, of course, is that you have an upfront cost. Um, and this is one of the things that I'm finding is, was a difficult decision for us. And I know that other uh, businesses are having the difficulty with it's sort of a pay now or pay later thing. And do you have the available funds to be paying now? Uh, and it, so just, you know, every place business is a little bit different on what options are available to them um, because of their available resources. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just seeing that a lot of businesses are being forced into the least costly option, like at the moment, because of lack of resources, this is a, an unfunded mandate uh, as it stands right now. So, I, just real quickly about the funding aspect of it, I do want to share you, know, yeah. some, of you some of you that are hooked in a little bit more with uh, the big advocacy groups may be aware of this, but they are, you know, certainly uh, service provider groups that are having discussions with the Department of Developmental Services right now about this increased cost that everyone that are service providers are having to incur to, or, in order to be able to do this. And, you know, as Garrett mentioned, I mean, it, it, for especially when you get to being a, one of these larger agencies that service, you know, dozens of clients, the costs up front can be significant. And, you know, you guys get paid in the rears. So, um, you know, for a company that is, that is a big challenge, but um, being able to share little things like this, like I didn't know about EMED, I had not heard about that specifically. And I know that we're scouring, uh, you know, Hewitt's on here and Hewitt's special uh, project this week has been finding tests by any means necessary um, throughout all of California. And so, um, it, you know, we being able to share what's working, what's not working, et cetera, it, is very helpful. And I know as we look at securing tests for ourselves, which we certainly need to do for our regional center. Um, we know that we have also a responsibility to all of you as our service providers to make sure that you have access to, you know, ways that you can access this stuff as well. And we certainly don't want there to be huge costs associated to this, but um, we know we know right now that, you know, the order doesn't give a lot of flexibility. It's testing needed to start back then. And um, you all, you know, are certainly trying to do your very best to comply as as is the regional center. We we were also, you know, subject to it and I wouldn't say surprised by it, but subject to it, you know, at the exact same time frames that our service providers were. I want to jump into the, some of the chat comments real quickly and before I get back to you all and kind of some of your shared experiences. So um, for uh, from Terry Corey, we have also negative tests don't mean staff can come back. So, uh, they still need to quarantine if you've been exposed. So we've certainly seen some changes related to that, right? About the time frame that people are required to uh, quarantine now with that are asymptomatic, which is a little bit different than the guidance that we had had, you know, a year plus ago. But on the other hand, we've also got a very large group of folks that are vaccinated now that weren't. Um, regarding vaccinations, just real quickly, uh, our regional center is right up there at the top still, as far as uh, the number of individuals that are vaccinated, the percentage of our clients that are vaccinated. DDS's records showed over 10 or right around 10,000 of our clients had received at least one vaccination as of over a month ago or right around a month ago. So um, again, we're even hoping for more and more of that, um, especially since we know that we didn't have all the responses for the kids that were you know, more recently um, eligible to receive those. So I'm gonna go ahead into a couple more chat things, but I do, I saw Jason joined us, one of our community services specialists. Good morning, Jason and Johnny, one of our other uh, associate client services directors is here as well. Good morning, Johnny. So looking at the comments here, um, and Rachel put then, Rachel reached out to me, um, gosh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago about this. And then a couple more staff actually just reached out to me um, as well. Rachel, I wonder if you'd be willing to unmute yourself and just share with us kind of what, where, where all you've been looking to try to find these things. And uh, if there is anything that's working, what's working, it doesn't look like there hasn't been so far, but what are, what, what have you kind of already tried? 
Sure. So we, we've tried, I think, a lot of the same things that everyone else has mentioned. We um, explored becoming a test site and the costs were just too high for us. Um, we were just not able to, to make that work. Um, so really what we've been doing is just kind of obsessively checking um, all different types of websites for availability of at-home test kits. Um, we found um, one website, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard iHealth, um, they have the at-home yeah. COVID test kits. They do have um, business ordering available directly on their website. So you can, you know, purchase, I think like 180 um, test kits, I want to say is like the, um, the cheapest option that they have. So we are um, probably going to be purchasing just those at home test kits for when we have staff who can't get into, um, you know, actual in person testing locations. Um, but really, it's we've just been, you know, checking every website we can to see where there are appointments available for testing. Um, but it's been. Um, it's been directing or uh, impacting our direct services with individuals because we just, you know, we can't get staff tested. We don't know what their status is. Um, we do not want um, anyone to <laughs> to get sick because they have um, someone show up to support them who is potentially um, infectious. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a really uh, challenging few weeks. I know we've had the highest number of cases in the past three weeks than we've had in almost two years. Um, so we're just really concerned about people and are just, yeah, having a tough time finding any sort of testing. And yes, I will put those resources I've mentioned in the chat um, for folks. Rachel's been to these meetings before. She knows we like to put like to put our resources in the chat. I think, Michelle, we used iHealth to buy some yesterday, if I remember correctly. I think Iqbal bought um, several hundred uh, yesterday tests. We... Um, Again, you know, this is impacting everyone. So it's, it, I think it's good to look at the different comments and, and hearing from, you know, whether it's day services, transportation, you know, uh, SLS, ILS, you know, it's, it's, it's all impacting us. Um, let's see. Uh, Kate asks, I may have missed this, the, this. Andrea, would it be an option for other agencies to send staff to your testing site? Um, so for tests, so. And Andrea's response is no, um, that right now they're just starting with their own staff and they're gonna have their first uh, go at it next week. Let's see, um, and, and noting that they really don't have the manpower to support, um, yeah, uh, uh, testing probably for people that are not uh, their own employees. Uh, from advanced kids, Kala, uh, Tanya Nally, uh, my biggest concern is the mandate for weekly COVID testing that went into effect 12, 27 for license setting when staff can't seem to get tests scheduled. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Olivia obviously oversees our, the residential side of, of the building and, and we are well aware of the, the challenges that are being faced by our residential service providers. We've got a meeting with community care licensing on Monday, right? Monday afternoon. And I think we definitely are going to need to have that discussion with community care licensing about how we are maintaining the residential workforce in in licensed care while we continue to have this issue. And, and um, last January was rough. I mean, it was really, really challenging. Um, and and <laughs> Michelle and I had a number of like late evenings trying to make sure that we had enough uh, support for our residential service providers in those care homes. Um, and we, you know, ended up having to figure out different ways to get staffing. And I will tell you, I, I have a meeting later this afternoon with the Department of Developmental Services to talk about um, some additional support uh, to our service providers and and how we can use possibly, you know, a, a state contracted um, a registry agency to to support folks. But um, the reality is, is that it all is dependent on a workforce that's available. Um, and willing to do the work as well. And that was already a challenge for folks on top of then the vaccine mandate and then now the booster mandate. So um, certainly share the concerns uh, addressed on the residential side. Um, let's see. Uh, supported employment, tailored day services, and also community-based uh, day programming are all um, additional services that are offered by um, an alliance as well to kind of give you an idea about, um, you know, that the different types of staff that also need to get um, vaccinated. 
let's see. Another issue, uh, this is from DDSO from Yvonne. Another issue has been inconsistencies with mask fittings. Even though we can use the same type of mask for employees, different locations of the same company rate the effectiveness of the masks. We're having to send employees back for retesting, which is another increased cost. Um, and I am curious, and I wonder if anyone else is running into that similar issue that DDSO is running into. And, um, you know, is there a, what, I guess one question I would ask Yvonne is, you know, what is it as far as the, 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 the real costs themselves? Like, what are we looking at, like, per employee as far as that, that impact on a service provider? Because we don't, we don't know unless we ask you guys some of these things. It's really helpful for us to know some of the um, financial strains that that things like this happen with you guys. It's about seventy dollars per fitting, per person. Wow. And we use Concentra. So if someone has a another um, business that they use for the mask fittings, um, I would uh, hope you could share that with us. Yes, absolutely. So, it, so real quickly, if you do have that, and we're gonna we're gonna keep rolling through some of the chat comments, but if you do have a different option that you might be able to share with DDSO, can you please drop it in the chat, and then we'll get to it kind of as we continue on through our our conversation here. Um, and then there was a question from Lindsay from uh, VTE, uh, Rachel and Garrett. Would you be willing to put those resources? Okay, we're gonna get in the chat either a link or just the correct spelling of um, the resources and there's the eye health uh, information that's in there. And that is the same one that we used um, to uh, purchase ours. And uh, we just learned about it, what, like a day ago. Um, and it was from a service provider that did as well. And then Garrett's put the information in there about eMed and eMed is the one that uh, offers that Binax now, right? And then you can develop a business contract with them um, as well. And so, um, Garrett, if you wouldn't mind, because there might be people that want to talk about kind of what you look at price wise and stuff like that. So if you could drop your email in there, that might be helpful for some folks that might have some kind of further questions. It does not appear that think like, well, let me ask this and Garrett, I'll ask you specifically for something like that. EMED is it, it does it really have to be tied just to your site and your company? Or would there be a way for it to be like, you know, CLO is going to be the, you know, clearinghouse for, you know, a certain number of these or, or something like that? Or does it really have to be tied to your company? Um, I'm trying to think of a way it couldn't be tied to your company. I think it does have to be tied to your company because what they do is they set up um, like uh they house the documents for you and they do all of your alerts and your reporting for you too. So like they contact uh, public health, they send you alerts when you have positive tests, they, you know, maintain OSHA compliant, uh, uh, like all of the results for that so that you don't have to take on that administrative overhead. So I think it does have to be specific to your company. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and then Rachel's put the information in there uh, on how to become a testing site. Uh, and let's see, SLS Health 2, we've been hit hard this last week. Yeah. So, um, again, as well, um, I will say we, we've had to do some things to help support some of our SLS agencies um, and, and certainly want to look at supporting all of our SLS agencies. But we did have um, some agencies that uh, really were impacted significantly by the snow and the power outages that occurred um, and trying to support clients that were in those types of situations. And so um, I will say that Alta is looking at uh, some additional support to those specific agencies. Um, but just in general, talking about all of this, there's just these increased costs that everyone is seeing. And again, this meeting helps bring some of that stuff into focus for us because you know, we're not having, you know, one to one discussions with, you know, the uh, what 1200 or so different vendorizations that bill us every month um, about, you know, this specific impact. Uh, Charlie Coco, good to hear from you. Um, will Cal EVV be discussed it at all in this meeting? So the Cal EVV, the electronic visit verification, we can certainly, I'll just put a little note down here to, to get into the Cal EVV and, um, at most, I think what we are going to need to do is make sure that we 
um, and I, between Jean and um, Olivia primarily, we just need to make sure that our specialists can provide the support to our service providers that are, you know, we talked about EVV being a slow walk and then a fast run now that, you know, January is hit and we need to make sure that um, all of our service providers get their questions answered. Um, and we did include some of that information in our newsletter, but we'll try to touch on it a little bit more um, this morning as well. Um, so let's see, uh, uh, well space. So this is from Kate um, uh, from Southside Unlimited. Well space at 2433 Marconi had test kits available this morning, PCR or rapid, but they said they'll probably run out um, and it's walk-in. So if anyone is nearby, uh, Marconi uh, in Sacramento, and you want to be able to go swing by and grab some tests. I think the what did we learn that the libraries were giving out the public libraries were giving out tests uh, two three days ago uh, as well that you know could be picked up there. Jody Bailey uh, says that up in El Dorado County, um, they sent out their person to the facility, and so maybe check with the. Um, with the with the county. So Jody, um, if you would not mind unmuting yourself real quickly, I just want to ask a question about that. So that was um, a person from El Dorado County Public Health then that came oh. out and did testing for you guys. Uh, no, they did, came out and did the fit the fit test. Oh, for they came out the fit testing. Yeah, okay. it was it was free for the organization. Well, DDSO needs to move up to El Dorado County, apparently. <laughs> I was or, just uh, saying, check with the county, possibly. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Um, that's thank you. Very good advice. Um, and then, uh, Jessica, do you mind real quickly the the wellness mark for the fifty five dollars? Can you explain? Is that for the mask fittings, or is that where I can go buy a bunch of tests? That one's for the, the fit testing. Oh, very good. Okay, so we have Wellness Mart as a resource for fit, fit, ah, fit testing. Um, and then you see Garrett's information that he's put in there if you wanted to talk a little bit more about EMED and what they're doing with their company. Um, have organizations, this is from Lindsay Diva, um, VT, have organizations changed their quarantine protocols to be in line with CDC's five day quarantine of vaccinated individuals? We have kept the 10 day quarantine requirement because I have seen CDPH update their quarantine guidance and we need to follow the most restrictive guidelines. We're wondering how others are handling this. So again, we, we mentioned that a little bit earlier that, that we have these shifting, you know, shifting guidelines related to that um, specifically. So uh, other folks are folks looking at uh, implementing the five day quarantine for your asymptomatic staff that have been um, exposed or, or are we looking at a, a 10 day still? There was a lot of follow up in the chat, John. Um, I'm keep going then. Yeah, most people are sticking with, or everybody that's put in the chat has been sticking with the 10 day. This is our most active chat box in a year and a half of doing these meetings. I just want to share with you guys. It's great. I love it. Um, so, is there a pin for the weekly COVID testing mandate for residential homes? There's a pin coming out today. I know that. Um, because we got a preview of it uh, yesterday, and that's uh, provider information notice. And what I will share, Crystal, is that we will, um, the most recent pin that comes out from CCL, um, we'll make sure that we get it out, sent to everyone via the um, uh, our MailChimp server so that everyone that's signed up for it. As I've said before, even though many of you don't run, you know, licensed uh, residential facilities, um, whether it's a day program or a care home or whatever else, it's really good to know kind of what's going on with the, the general community. And let's see, Lindsay, we're doing the same. They've kept 10 days. So it looks like uh, several different providers have, have kept that uh, 10 days. And uh, Hillary uh, wants to make sure that they know the same resources that uh, Jody knows up in El Dorado uh, County for those uh, those free fit testings. So um, maybe if you guys can connect with each other, if you guys have the name of someone that might be helpful, um, you know, Hillary, if you want to try to um, connect with Jody um, about that, might be very helpful. Let's see. For the Wellness Mart, does it include the doctor note? Um, let's see. Do we have an answer for that one? For Wellness Mart, 
does it include the doctor note for someone that has already used it? I think that's Jessica. Sorry, what was that? I didn't hear the last part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the wellness, uh, it, does it include the doctor's note? I believe so, yes. All right. And sticking to OSHA rules, they are the folks that will get us in trouble, spoken like the executive director of a large agency. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, sticking with 10 days. Uh, yes, there is a pen. I'll see if we can share it here. Just a tip for Wellness Mart. They do business accounts and will bill you monthly. We set up years ago. I assume they still do this. We use them for uh, live scans and for TV tests. Um, so we have in the chat as well that just got dropped in there, which is the new provider information notice um, from uh, community care licensing. And so you can take a look about what look at what, what their updated guidance is. So um, I will share with folks that um, we have seen a lot of increased cases. We, uh, for so long, we're at like one case, two cases. We had a few days where Lisa didn't have to report any cases. And when you've got, you know, 27,000 clients, that's saying something that we don't have any new cases. And that went on for a little while. Um, we reported 16 new cases yesterday, which I, I don't recall the last time we reported that many new cases in one day for our regional center. I can't remember how long it's been. So, um, I will say that we were, we felt like we were in a good spot because we also had no clients in the hospital, but we do have a couple clients that are now also in the hospital um, as well. Again, I think in many ways, you know, our, our, our client community and our service providers really benefit from all of the vaccinations that have gone on, you know, certainly the, the big efforts to get boosters as well, but we're aware that this is um, a virulent stream of, uh, of the, of COVID and people are getting like crazy. So, um, with that being said, um, there was a new Sacramento County public health order that was put in place a couple days ago. And it talks about limiting, um, activities. Some of you may have seen Dr. Kasiri, who's the public health officer for Sacramento County that, um, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, all right. Do we see a public health order on there? And we're going to probably make this a little bit bigger if we can. So, again, this is a public health order from January 6th. Um, it's in relation to the emergence of the Omicron variant and the, uh, the uh, just how, um, the case rate has just rapidly increased to a point of 80.3 per 100 residents, um, which is, you know, we were, <laughs> we were at such a low, low number, you know, we were at like a dozen, less than a dozen and to pop up at such a huge number. It certainly makes sense. And I, I, I dreading hearing how many new cases that Lisa is going to be reporting to the Department of Developmental Services today um, of our client population. So. Again, there's at the beginning of these things, always a justification as to why they're doing it. And then it goes into the specific order. The order goes into effect January 6th at 8 a.m., which was yesterday morning, and it excuses the utilization of you know, public meetings in essence for government functions. So public boards, councils, commissions, and other similar bodies shall suspend in-person public meetings and conduct all meetings virtually. Affected bodies shall ensure opportunities for virtual public participation and compliance with the Brown Act and all other relevant statutes. Um, the ones that really apply to us are more like number four. Um, employers and businesses shall consider conducting meetings remotely and take other measures as necessary to reduce transmission risk as much as business needs will permit. Um, employers and businesses subject to Cal OSHA COVID-19 emergency temporary standards and or Cal OSHA aerosol transmissible diseases standards should consult the applicable regulations for additional requirements, the ETS, allow local health jurisdictions to mandate more protective measures. And then it goes into just where to get copies of the orders, et cetera. So with that being said, um, and I think we still have, uh, we might have some of our case management folks that are still on here, but um, we have a, uh, we still have a requirement to conduct in-person meetings for regional center business. We uh, specifically thinking about uh, individual program plan meetings. Uh, right now, the uh, 
rules are still that it is up to the uh, client and family choice um, when it comes to whether or not those meetings occur in person or not. There's certainly lots of discussion going on at a statewide level as to the extent to which that's pertinent with the um, Omicron spreading the way that it is. Um, but as of this time right now, it has not been. Some of you may remember in the, the, you know, the depth of the pandemic previously that, you know, some of that stuff was waived in order to make sure that we were still conducting these meetings, but that we, you know, kept up with public safety. And so as of right now, there has not been any additional changes from the Department of Developmental Services related to um, whether or not we're conducting in person um, visits and, biz and business. That being said, um, you know, certainly uh, the individuals that are going to be coming out to the, uh, you know, whether it's a residential care facility, SLS setting, you know, day program, you know, wherever else, you know, our staff, you know, will be coming out when they're full PPE. And uh, certainly we are very pleased that I think we're at like a 95% of our staff or something or more that are, are vaccinated. And so, um, you know, certainly feel um, like we're we have that requirement that we still need to conduct the, some of those in person type of activities, but that we're sending out folks kind of in the safest manner possible. But, but it's a challenge because this is going on everywhere. I, I, gosh, Shirley, I think you were the one that sent out the list to me of all of the day programs that have suspended in person services um, as of yesterday. Um, and I think there was at least five that were doing in person services that have now put a temporary pause on those services. As a reminder, you know, there's still, you know, the ability to bill for alternative services. There's still the ability to, you know, do your traditional services in a remote manner. Like th those are all things that are, are still available as far as uh, billing opportunities. And if you are unsure about that, you know, you're welcome to reach out to your assigned community services specialist. Um, and if, as always, I always say, if you're unaware of who your assigned community services specialist is, you guys can reach out to Christine Hobbs, who is one of our office assistants, and um, maybe someone can drop her uh, email into the chat for you service providers if you want to reach out and find out who your specialist is. Let's see. So um, I want to touch on just a few more things here. Um, I'm going to actually throw it over to Olivia real quickly to give an update on the rate uh, study implementation. Kind of where we're at. So, so far we have received 2 batches from DDS. So our staff over the holidays had fun going through all those digging into program designs and then contacting providers. If they have any questions, we received our 3rd batch, I believe on Monday. So accounting is doing their 1st round of their input and then um, our specialists will be starting to work on those at uh, the beginning of next week. So uh, that's kind of the update on that. We're trying to. Uh, get all the information up to date and move as quickly as possible so we can get the answers back to DDS to get the next section going. Fit into the role. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just answer first people. Thank you very much, Olivia. Additionally, just to kind of share other things that are going on right now, we have um, the community placement plan and community resource development plan that are in uh, process. So I'm going to throw it over to Jordan, who is responsible for that side of things to give us a little update on where we're at with it, when we're, when we're going to supposed to be turning it in, et cetera. Um, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, we are excited to be working on our CPP development plan for this year. Um, just to let you guys know two things for sure that we are going to be requesting um, is uh, a 21 set aside unit housing project, right? That would be an Elk Grove. It's called Cornerstone. Um, I'm sure John may have previously mentioned to you guys the Marisol Village um, housing project that we are currently working on developing, right? Um, we are also going to be asking for $10,000 to set up a demonstration unit for technology assistance, right? So if we have individuals um, that live independently, for example, right, and um, they, they would allow us to put some kind of technology in to help monitor like their medication administration, right? So, for example, if we have a client who lives alone, 
alone and um, they kept their medications in a drawer, we, there would actually be a sensor on that drawer to know if the client opened up the drawer or not at the time that they were supposed to be taking those medications, right? Or for example, if we had a client that might sometimes wander the complex independently, it would allow a sensor to go off when the door was opened, right? So looking at a unit to educate clients and even our legislature, right, about what a unit would look like with assistive technology. Thank you very much, Jordan. So, you know, we had an opportunity to participate in a uh, presentation uh, what, three, four weeks ago. And in that presentation, there was the discussion of, you know, assistive technology. And we've been talking about it for a long time in SLS and ILS settings. But one of the barriers has been that there's not really like a unified way to monitor everything at once. And the technology seems to have kind of caught up a little bit so that you don't have one medication dispenser technology. You don't have another front door chime technology. You don't have, like it's, it would be all together in one and something that could be monitored uh, in essence all at once. And um, we've heard loud and clear from everyone that there are significant challenges securing staff for our ever growing population of individuals. And if there is a way that we can allow individuals to be able to live independently um, without having uh, staff smothering them at all times um, and, and being able to have, you know, opportunity to have some freedom and um, some privacy, but still have some certain safety measures kind of in place to ensure that um, the individual has, you know, I guess, in essence, every opportunity to be able to live out independently, but um, again, some of the safety concerns are, are somewhat mitigated. Right now, we would love to be able to, you know, have that become something that is spread out amongst our catchment area, amongst California, that it's really widely known, but I think we need to be able to show people what it looks like. And so the hope is, is that we can get funding from the Department of Developmental Services to, um, put these assistive technologies into one of the units that we're going to be building on uh, Richards Boulevard at the Mirasol Village project. And so we're hoping that again, we'll also have a client that's willing to help showcase some of these things um, that might be uh, utilized in their unit as well. And um, with the, the hope that we can um, spread this uh, to other agencies that might be interested in doing it. And also even working with uh, people like, um, Property management folks, I know that we're, we're going to be meeting with uh, the property management folks for our set aside apartments so that we can kind of talk about the benefits of utilizing this um, with our uh, clients. So more to come on that. I'm hoping that DDS ends up funding it. I think we're going to end up doing it 1 way or the other, um, but it would be nice to have it through a, a startup project. So we're going to turn those in on Friday, right? Jordan next yep. week. From today. Next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, a week from today, we'll be sending in our CPP plan and our CRDP plan. There's some other things that we're looking at right now in order to look at getting Portable Developmental Center down to having, you know, no clients in it and to really try to minimize moving people out of the area. Um, so we've got individuals that are like in Southern California and really high level settings and um, it would be much better for us to have folks local here, you know, closer to their families and, and closer to the, you know, the rest of their planning team. And so uh, we're trying to work on a request for a few more services to do things like stepping people out of like high level, um, uh, you know, uh, institutional type settings like the, the state run facilities. And so far, so much of it has been you guys, you SLS providers that have been, uh, you know, many of you that have taken these individuals directly out of those settings. And you guys know just how challenging that can be moving someone out of something like an Institute for Mental Disease, you know, right into a, an SLS setting. So again, hoping to provide some, um, you know, additional supports to our clients so we can make those transitions happen. I want to let's see if I can figure out a way to open this real quick. Um, I want to go to our um, website because I want to share something that we talked about previously in this meeting and um, now it has come to fruition, which is we have uh, written a, uh, a newsletter. So Alta, uh, some of you, gosh, some of you used to work at Alta quite some time ago, but uh, let's see. I don't know who we have here that's senior. Is it Tracy? Possibly. Tracy, can you tell us how long ago it was since Alta's had a newsletter? Uh, it, it's been uh, many, many years. I don't know how long ago exactly because um, I'm getting old and my memory is not good. 
but I, it's been at least probably 15. I think that's what we were thinking. Gene, does that sound about right? Maybe 15 years or more since we've had a newsletter for the regional center? At least, yeah. So and let me have, just say, um, Gene is the senior one. Yeah, sorry, I apologize there, Tracy, yes. And my memory is no better than yours, Tracy. <laughs> I mean, wait, um, I don't know if I said that right, but life goes by so fast, it's hard to figure out what, how many years ago it was. That's right. Well, we, we were able to bring it back and the, and we hope everyone received it. I think most of you folks are signed up um, for, to receive our MailChimp server. And uh, this is the Alta Connections newsletter, and it's a quarterly newsletter that we're going to be putting out. It's for clients, service providers, and staff. It's going to kind of updates on what's going on. Um, we've got some information from Ms. Lori Benalis here, our executive director, um, about, uh, you know, our future of opportunities. We have a staff highlight. We've got a uh, client spotlight. We've got information from our clinical department. We've got updates on our new initiatives, you know, things like coordinated future planning, things like the roadmap to competitive integrated employment, um, you know, included on here. And 1 thing that we really want to make sure that we're sharing with folks is. You know that we are having resource changes that are going on, and in many ways, you know, between Jean's staff and uh, Jordan's staff and Olivia's staff, you know, we're moving to a place where we are, you know, we're in scarcity when it comes to resources, but we're certainly trying to move towards abundance. And one of the things that we kind of measure that by is, you know, who are our new service providers, and then who is no longer providing services. And we think it's very important to be very transparent with our entire community. You shouldn't just have to go to a board meeting to find out this information. You should be able to uh, look it up and it should be on our website moving forward. So um, we talk about the new services uh, that we have in place. We did a spotlight on the housing access services. And I know we've talked about it a little bit in here and we can certainly talk about it more in the future, but the housing access services is a uh, um, regional center, you know, uh, it's been on our wish list. Gosh, I can't even remember how, you know, for how many years and, you know, we finally got a, a, the service in place and now we're able to help support more individuals with being able to transition into their own, you know, housing that they uh, desire to live in and as well as helping people keep that housing once they are um, in it. So, additionally, we talk a little bit about the what's new in 2022, the Burns and Associates rate study implementation that Olivia just mentioned. Uh, right now, there's a little bit more information in here about the electronic visit verification. Additionally, more information about our Mirasol Village um, multifamily housing development. But what I, you know, I assume that everyone reads to the last pages of these things, but um, you can see our numbers here. I think it would be nice to be able to track our increase of numbers that are served by our regional center and um, the new positions that are with the regional center as well. So we've got Hewitt in here, you know, you guys have met him already. We've hired our deaf and hard of hearing specialist and uh, Olivia, why don't you share with folks who that is? Sure, her name is Rima Cornish and um, she was previously working at the school districts and she is super excited to be here and to help the regional center, but also our service providers. I think the top thing on our to do list right now is to put together some internal and external trainings of how to work with individuals that um, may be deaf or hard of hearing and what are some of the things to think about. So we are getting started on that. She started on Monday. She met with Carol Wilhelms. Uh, service coordinators this week, so they could give her their to do list. Uh, and so we're going to hopefully hit the ground running. Perfect. Thank you very much. And um, additionally, we started this kind of new idea that Lori Benalis had about wanting to feature um, our artists and wanting to support our artists in selling their work. And I thought it was a really cool idea. And so we, uh, Libby and I met with some of our providers and we talked about it a little bit. And basically what we landed on, which I think we've shared with you in the past, is that we're going to do a rotation of um, every quarter, you know, looking at, you know, in essence, kind of sponsoring or, or featuring one of our artists. And you can see Lindsay here and some of the things that she does. And um, again, just really appreciate uh, work of art in Auburn for uh, assisting and facilitating us to get all this information so we could, um, you know, be able to spotlight one of our very talented regional center clients. 
Additionally, and I just want to go over these last few things real quickly. We um, put some attachments here of things that we think are really important. So one of them is if you have a client that might be interested in one of those units on Richards Boulevard, now we have the way to sign up and to, to show your interest. So if you click on this, and we're going to send this out uh, again, I think on Monday as well. Um, but uh, if you click on this, it'll lead to a survey where you can put in your interest of possibly being able to rent one of the units on Richards Boulevard. And so um, I will say there's also information on here about the upcoming public meetings that we're going to be holding and how we're going to be going about, um, yeah, you know, uh, making opportunities for folks to be able to access those units. Uh, Charlotte Coco, uh, thank you very much I, uh, for the question related to EVV. EVV is here and it's going to be here to stay. What we included here for everyone is the frequently asked questions about electronic visit verification that have been put out by the Department of Developmental Services. And so you can see the um, EVV FAQs that are in here. And what I would say related to any service provider, if you are unsure of, you know, at this point, if you're unsure whether or not you qualify or you should be doing EVV, um, please reach out to your assigned community services specialist as soon as possible. Um, we would love to get questions from service providers about EVV so that we can, you know, possibly even hold a, a, a vendor specific like vendor forum for those service providers that are required to do the EVV. So if you have issues or questions related to that, please reach out directly to your assigned community services specialist. And again, you can, you know, Christine Hobbs, and that's C Hobbs with an S at the end at Alter Regional. Dot org, and she can let you know who your assigned specialist is. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I will. Well, I will note as well. Um, and for those of you that we also did translate this into Spanish as well. And the survey, for example, for the housing um, is also a Spanish uh, survey. And we are going to be looking at trying to expand this newsletter to more of our native languages that um, are spoken by our you know very diverse population. So we're just kind of getting started here. We're going to do Spanish first, and then we'll look at expanding it as we do more and more of these uh, quarterly newsletters. So with that being said, we filled up 59 minutes. It's been very tough uh, not being able to see you folks for several weeks. So I'm glad we had such lively discussions and so much information sharing in the chat box. Please uh, communicate with your community service specialist for issues or questions that you have. Thank you very much, regional center staff, for being here and letting me call on some of you guys as well while we we do this stuff. And um, again, just try to be as much as support to people as we can, um, and reach out to the regional center. Let us know, you know, what's going on with you guys, um, you know, so that we can see if we can provide some support. And if anything, I will share with you, we will continue to have discussions about the increased costs that each of you are facing right now related to these mandates and seeing if there's any relief that we can look at providing broadly to all of you because you really fall under that category. So um, we are certainly interested in trying to assist you guys. In that. So hope you guys have a great rest of your day, a great uh, weekend. Look forward to talking to everyone next week and uh, happy new year folks.